According to Historic England, Officer's Dyke is the largest linear earthwork in Britain, approximately 220 kilometres running from Trudin near Mould to Sedbury near Chepstow on the Severn Estuary. It was constructed towards the end of the 8th century AD by the Mercian King Offa, who is believed to have formed a long-lived territorial and possibly defensive boundary between the Saxon kingdoms of Mercia and the Welsh kingdoms. The dyke is not continuous and consists of a number of discrete lengths separated by gaps of up to 23 kilometres. It is clear from the nature of certain sections that the differences in the scale and character of the adjoining proportions were the result of separate gangs being employed on different lengths. Where possible, the natural topographic features such as slopes or rivers were utilised and the form of Offa's Dyke is therefore clearly related to the topography. Although most of its lengths it consists of a bank and a ditch to the west. Excavations have indicated that at least some lengths of the bank had a vertical outer face of either laid stone or turf revetment. The ditch generally seems to have been used to provide most of the bank material, although there is also evidence of some locations of shallow quarries. In places, a berm divides the bank and ditch, and a counterscarp bank may be present on the lip of the ditch. Offa's Dyke now survives in various states of preservation in the form of earthworks and where sections have been levelled and infilled as buried features. Although some sections of the frontier system no longer survive visibly, sufficient evidence does exist for its position to be accurately identified throughout most of its length. In view of its contribution towards the study of early medieval territorial patterns, all sections of Offa's Dyke exhibiting significant archaeological remains are considered worthily of protection. The reality is that Offa's Dyke is a complete mystery to the archaeologists and historians, and it is incomplete and varies from section to section. This is the first LIDAR survey of this earthwork undertaken for its entire length and every metre that is supposedly marked on the landscape. The consequences of this survey changes the nature and understanding of this dyke to such an extent that it reinvents the history of this scheduled monument, which will have repercussions for decades to come. So come fly with me as we go over Offa's Dyke to find out what the dyke really was, who built it and why. Within this first section we can show very clearly that one of the archaeologists ideas about Offa's Dyke that it's a defensive ditch can be shown to be incorrect. Not only could the attacker simply walk around the edge of the dyke but they could attack the smaller ditch and bank in the centre of the valley, which has shrunk from 2.58 metres deep to 0.8, and the bank moving from 2 metres high to just 0.6 metres high. Moreover, a better and more obvious landscape feature, the edge of the Dry River Valley, could have easily been chosen and would have secured a defensive position if required. Furthermore, sections 1 to 4 cut across the peninsula where the River Wye meets the Bristol Channel, the River Severn, but makes no sense as either the boundary marker or a defensive ditch, as the best defensive structure, the land marker, would have been the river's shoreline, surely. It should also be noted in this section that excavations found clay deposits in my trilogy, The Stone Enigma, I identified the same sort of clay deposits within Stonehenge's ditches and linked them to dewponds, which is a layer of, for water preservation. This type of clay lining is also found in the vallum and Wandstike ditches, which suggests that it is added later to improve the ditch's water retention as a canal. At the western point of section 4, 
Offenstein disappears for over 2,000 metres. Some archaeologists suggest it hugs the river shoreline. But I find Chepstow's town walls interesting as it seems to follow the line of the dike. This suspicion is confirmed by the construction of the port wall, which is a mysterious ditch of office proportions outside the town wall. The ditch is almost non-existent at this point, although the bank is extensive and of standard width. This is compounded by the 1800s OS map placing the dike heading for two large quarry pits south of the Lada map. The contiguous row of quarry pits as shown in reports, suggest that it is a later connecting road used to connect the dike banks far in the path of the river to the quarry pits, which in turn became part of an even later Roman road which intersects the earthworks banks further south of the section. Consequently, I was seeing why the dike was built initially to connect to the quarry pits, which then became a road when the canal finally dried up. This section is Lancoot Fault. Looking at the 0800 1800s map, it looks like a classic cross dike, cut in the corner of the River Wye. Wherever you could call it a part of Office Dyke, as we are seeing, is questionable, as the northern end of the dike heads directly for the river and not around the cliff edge, as suggested. This is one of 14 gaps, very large gaps. In Offers Dyke, in fact, 34% of Section A is missing. And as you see, there is absolutely no sign of a dike whatsoever, which confirms our idea that, that Offers Dyke is made of a series of small dikes and not one large continuous dike. We see again the connection of the dike with quarry pits in this section. The idea is being a border marker is also called into question and it's a cliff face by the river. And a river would have been a much better marker than a bank on top of a hill, surely. The dike loses its structure down the river valley and the ditch moves to the other side of the dike, again indicating that it's not used as a defensive earthwork. Quarries are all around this section, indicating the use and function of the dike in the past. Further investigation needs to be made to understand the dates of these quarries to see if they are prehistoric, Roman or both. The official description of this section as a defensive feature is very questionable. Archaeologists have invented or exaggerated some aspects and ignored the obvious in an attempt to prove a fundamentally flawed theory. Moreover, another anomaly is the two connecting earthworks to offer found in high wood, but not appearing on RS maps, or reported by field archaeologists. These two ditches seem to connect to a feature that is 60 metres by 46 metres in the middle of the wood, which today is unidentified. The question is, is it Roman? And why was it connected to the dike? Here in section 13, we see two of the reasons we think that Offa's dike was a canal taking commodities by boat to the sea. Firstly, we have a natural spring actually underneath the dike. Now, there's no reason that you would build a dike with a spring directly underneath it unless you wanted to put it there because you wanted the dike to be full of water. We have seen hundreds of springs, some of them directly underneath the ditches in other places of Britain, in other dikes. Here, this spring is at a height of 183 meters. So it's high on the hill. And as you see from the old survey map, there's a kink in the dike, it could go straight on, it then it's actually kinked towards the spring, so the engineers have aimed for the spring, obviously for the water. The other aspect to see is the Roman camp and the Roman ditches that joined Offa's dike. This interconnection proves that the Romans used Offa's dike. 
The question is, was Offa's Dyke there from prehistory and they reutilized it, or did they actually dig Offa's Dyke from scratch? On this section, sadly, any idea of a ditch is no longer necessary as part of Offa's Dyke, particularly when it completely disappears and it shows how archaeologists are bemused by these earthworks and their function. The other interesting feature missed by the field archaeologists is the pathway leading east to west that cuts the line of the dike at the bottom of the hill. LIDAR suggests that it sits in an unusually deep ditch with banks to the south and at the bottom of the valley. As this section goes into a quite a large river valley, we should take time to look at the specifications of the dike across this valley because it tells us a lot about the environment in the past. At the top of the hills we see that the ditches are quite deep, they're 1, 1, 1 to 1 1.5 meters in height. As it goes across the valley the ditch actually reduces drastically and it's, one point, it's 0 0.3 meters high which is a fifth of the size of the, the bigger ditches at the top of the valley. But if we look at the bank, the bank is continuous. It's, it's about the same width as between six and eight meters going across the valley, sometimes a little bit bigger, uh, 10 meters wide. But the most interesting aspect of this is that they're fragmented. There isn't a continuous ditch going across. It's done in small patches. And there must be a logic for that. This is not the only place we see this fragmentation of Offa's Dyke. We will see it in other places. But on this occasion, I thought it'd take time out to look at this in detail. So when we see it again, we understand what's happening in the landscape. What LIDAR has now revealed is that between these ditches, we have a very thin, what looks like groove or cut made in between, which would allow individual, say, boats to follow a channel rather than a large ditch in between. And the only logical reason you would have this small channel cut between the larger ditches is so you could actually move something along the ditch, which will probably be a boat, and therefore they could be dragged from one ditch to another to continue their journey. The interesting aspect with the sizes of the ditches across this valley is that of course the ones at the top are much much larger than the ones in the middle which shows that the ones in the middle have been added at a late date. The ones at the top were obviously the original channels which means that the river which is obviously a tiny little stream now was much larger in the past and would have actually connected the two larger channels at the top of the valley which are 1.5 meters deep together. And so it would be a continuation of the canal. So you would get to the edge of one canal and then cross the river to the other side and reconnect with another canal. This process allows us to date roughly the time of construction. And we believe that this time period is obviously prehistoric, long before the Romans who probably added the smaller canal features in the valley when the water levels were lower. And therefore, we're probably looking at the Mesolithic or Neolithic period when these canals were first built. This is the end of part one of Arthur's Dyke. Hopefully you'll come and visit me on part two, where we will continue our journey over Arthur's Dyke to answer all the mysteries of what it was who made it and when.